So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Mr. Frazier for giving the presentation today. He has a beautiful picture out there. I hope he, he shows it to us all. Go ahead, Sue. Okay. Um, Stephen Frazier is hard of hearing and has worn hearing aids for over 30 years. He is trained as a hearing loss support specialist by the Hearing Loss Association of America and has worked for many years as a volunteer advocate for those with hearing loss. He has led numerous legislative initiatives that have made New Mexico one of the leading states in supporting people who cannot hear well. Steve participated in the passage of a law requiring health insurance to cover hearing aids for children. He served for many years as the HLAA New Mexico chapter coordinator, where he organized chapters in Santa Fe and Las Cruces and oversaw the operation of the state's three chapters. He worked with the Albuquerque City Council on the installation of a hearing loop in the council chamber. For 10 years, he served as the newsletter editor, webmaster, public relations person, and membership chair for the Albuquerque HLAA chapter. We talk about being a good volunteer. <laughs> At the national level, Steve was on the HLAA Hearing Loop Steering Committee and is one of the founding members of the HLAA Get in the Hearing Loop campaign. He has made countless presentations on hearing loop technology to service clubs, senior citizen groups, church leaders, and others. He has written articles on technology that appeared in Hearing Life, Hearing Health, Sound and Communications, Technology for Worship, and other magazines. Steve is the founder and co-chair of the Committee for Communication Access in New Mexico. One project the committee is currently working on is the installation of hearing loops at Sunport, which is the Albuquerque International Airport. Other projects include additional rules for audiologists and hearing aid dispensers in regard to consumer protection. He's led initiatives for city ordinances requiring that captions be turned on on TVs and such public places as sports bars, restaurants, waiting rooms, and other locations accessible to the public. Steve is definitely dedicating his life to making not only New Mexico, but our entire country a better place for all people with hearing loss. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Stephen O. Frazier. Stephen. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, other people may not realize it, that, that uh, I met you uh, almost 20 years ago uh, at the Omaha convention and, and uh, have always looked forward to, to seeing you at the conventions when I go. Um, I'm not just sure how this works if I... Okay, I've gone to full screen. Are, are you getting all getting the the slide now for my presentation? No. No, no. I, think, Stephen, I think you have to first click that share screen button at the bottom of Zoom. That green. Okay. Just a minute, let me go back to that. Got it. Okay. So 
uh, I'm talking today about America getting in the hearing loop. And uh, my first experience with hearing loops actually was, was over 20 years ago when uh, I had organized the group that Sue mentioned that was working on getting the Albuquerque noise code rewritten. And in doing research, I came up with an organization called SHHH. And uh, I went to their website and got the name of a, a person in Albuquerque who could tell me about it. And I went to my first uh, self-help for hard of hearing meeting. And as the meeting was starting, the woman next to me said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I don't hear the loop, is the loop on? And I looked at her and said, what's a, what's a loop? And she explained to me what it was. And ever since then, I've been answering that question for other people. What, what is a hearing loop? And uh, th that is uh, the topic of the conversation today. Uh, we'll be covering uh, several things, uh, the, the facts about hearing, what is an assistive listening system, the story of electromagnetic induction, what's a hearing loop, what's a telecoil, hearing loops are happening in America, and also uh, happening all over the world. Uh, about questions, if you have a question that is urgent, uh, please feel free to ask it and I'll uh, attempt to answer. But if it can wait until the end of the presentation, uh, it will help ensure that I get through all the slides that I have here. Some facts about hearing loss. Uh, there are 48 million people in the United States with a measurable hearing loss according to HLAA. Uh, I've seen other figures that are bigger than that and some that are smaller, uh, but uh, that's an enormous number of people. Hearing loss is viewed by many people as something that uh, just affects the people who are seniors. And actually that's not true. 65% of the people with diagnosed hearing loss are under the age of 65. And that includes 20% of the uh, school-aged children. As you know, you're all just as experienced as I am with wearing hearing aids. Uh, they are just an aid and that's the, they don't make your hearing go back to normal. I had a good example of that yesterday when my sister and I were standing on the patio behind my house. And she said, oh, I see you still have the cicadas going in here. Well, I could hear her perfectly well. She was about four feet away, but I didn't hear any cicadas at all. And that's a, a demonstration of the fact that hearing aids are really only effective about six to eight feet beyond uh, the person who's wearing them. Uh, sounds from, from further than that uh, are going to be problematic. Here are some statistics that, that again belie the fact that uh, Age is, is one of the major factors in hearing loss. Uh, four, over 4% 4 of people with hearing loss uh, were hard of hearing at birth. Uh, ear infections cause 12% of them. Ear injuries, almost 5%. Loud, brief noise exposure, 10%. And that can be uh, some young person that goes to a rock concert and sits up close to the band uh, right in front of a, a loudspeaker. And that one exposure can cause a, a permanent hearing loss. Uh, that plus other noise accounts for uh, about a third of all people who have a hearing loss. Uh, aging is really only uh, applied to about 28%. And uh, my bottom line there is getting covered up, uh, but it's, it's uh, basically lists other uh, causes for hearing loss. Now, uh, why is an, a, a loop or an assistive listening system needed? Uh, because of, partly because of the sound level of speech, uh, what's called the speech to noise ratio, uh, ambient noise, reverberation, and then what I call unfriendly, unfriendly PA systems. And uh, let's just look at those a little more closely. Uh, normal human speech is in the range of 60 to 65 decibels. Uh, and that's, very easy for somebody with hearing aids to wear, uh, wearing hearing aids. Uh, if the person or the sound that they're listening to is six to eight feet, uh, no more from them. Uh, you get into a, a large room and somebody is speaking on the other side of the meeting room, uh, 
you're not going to hear them well with hearing aids. Uh, distance increases or decreases the uh, level of sound. Uh, sound pressure decreases by six decibels every time the distance uh, is doubled. And because of the, the way decibels works, uh, a six decibel decrease is substantial. Uh, also, there's a problem because of the fact that high pitch sounds don't have the same amount of strength as low pitch sounds. Uh, and those are the ones that carry the sounds for, for uh, consonants that, that help us to recognize speech. You think about a boom car, which uh, were at least at one point very, very popular here in Albuquerque. You could hear the, the bass uh, rattling, but you didn't hear any other music coming from that car. Julia Sturkins and a number, a number of other researchers did a study uh, testing the effectiveness of hearing loops uh, in helping people hear. And in a, in a large room without a public ad address system, uh, the people with normal hearing were understanding about 80% of what was being said. People wearing hearing aids, only 14% of them uh, were, were uh, uh, only, they were only understanding about 14% of what was being said. Uh, when they turned the loop on, the figures changed dramatically. The, the number of people with hearing aids uh, were hearing around 70% of what was being said. The people with normal hearing were using receivers and, and earphones, but, but their uh, hearing only went up to about 90%. Uh, but they testified afterward that actually, if they went to some place that had a loop system, uh, they, would, they would want to use it if it was available to them. Normal hearing, there's, a, there's uh, in, in what's called the speech to noise ratio, uh, normal hearing, uh, you can hear well if the sound uh, background noises uh, are at least 10%, 10 decibels less than, than the human speech. So if someone is speaking and raise their voice a little bit to 70 decibels, uh, the, the noise level, say from a window air conditioner at 60 decibels, is not going to affect their ability to hear. However, for people with hearing loss, that was not, that's not true. Uh, they need a difference between the, the speaker's uh, voice and the background sound of anywhere from 20 to 25 decibels, which means that anything louder than a refrigerator is going to interfere uh, with their ability to hear. Uh, ambient noise is, is one of the big problems in any kind of a, of a meeting in a public venue uh, of any size. It can be people talking, fussy children, people coughing, uh, the hum from the air conditioning system. All of those uh, create uh, enough noise that you're, you're getting in again to the speech to noise ratio. And if the background sounds are loud enough, uh, it's going to become problematic for people to understand what's being said, unless they have an assistive listening system uh, that improves uh, the strength of the, the speech that they're trying to hear. Then when you add in echoes or uh, reverberation, it becomes even more difficult. Here's a chart that shows uh, the, the difference uh, between pre people with normal hearing and people who are hard of hearing even when they're wearing hearing aids in the number of words that they could recognize in a test. And you can see that as the reverberation increased, uh, the normal hearing people heard less or understood less, but the hard of hearing people had even more difficulty understanding what was being said. When you add, add uh, ambient noise to the reverberation, uh, the same thing happens. Uh, people with, with mild hearing loss or moderate hearing loss uh, don't hear and understand as much of what is being said as people with normal hearing even when they're wearing their hearing aids. Then there's the matter of unfriendly uh, public address systems where they have too much bass. Uh, this is not news to you uh, that uh, unless you're going to hear the high tones, you're not going to understand what's being said. That gets back to, to the fact that most people have a ski slope 
hearing loss and it's in the upper uh, register that they don't hear well. And if, if there's too much bass in a public address system, it doesn't matter how much, how loud they're going to turn the music up or the sound up, you're still not going to understand what's being said. Uh, I had an article that ran in Sound of Communications a magazine a couple of years ago uh, about this, the fact that louder isn't necessarily better. Uh, that uh, article, along with a lot of my other articles, are posted at my website, which is www.sofnabq.com. Now, assistive listening systems is a solution uh, to these problems. Uh, it will overcome most of the difficulty that a person has uh, appearing in a large or hearing rather in a large venue. So what is an assistive listening system? Well, the ADA defines it, uh, uh, as you can read there, it's an amplification system util utilizing transmitters, receivers, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that, again, addresses the problem of the uh, speech to uh, noise ratio, because the public address system or the uh, uh, assistive listening system increases the strength of the speech signal in relation to the, to the background noise. Now, there are a number of different types of assistive listening systems. The first would be uh, RF radio frequency, uh, which we've always known in the past as FM systems. Uh, one of the problems with that kind of a system is that it requires borrowing a receiver and a headset or a receiver and a neck loop. Uh, which means you have to, if you're using a headset, you have to take your hearing aids off and hope they don't get damaged or lost or, or whatever. And then you have to return the equipment when the, when the event is over with. Infrared systems basically work the same way and they have the same problems. Uh, AFILs, which is audio frequency induction loop systems, is, is the technical name for hearing loops. Uh, for people with telecoil equipped hearing aids or cochlear implants, no receiver is needed. You don't have to borrow anything. You don't have to return anything. You just come in the room and touch a button and turn on your telecoils. Now there's a new, a, a new uh, technology that is uh, emerging and that is Wi-Fi, uh, where the signal is being uh, transmitted using radio waves and what they call digital signal processing. Now th this system, uh, initially it looks like it could be very, very beneficial because uh, it, will, it will work without people having to borrow equipment uh, if they have a smartphone. Uh, the problem is that uh, various venues that use this type of technology all require that you download into your smartphone uh, an app that may only work for their particular system. You go to a church and it's using this and you download the system and you're fine. Then you go to some other place and they're using this technology, uh, but you have to download a different app. And, and this means that you have to have a, a smartphone and that you have to be technolo technologically sophisticated enough uh, to know how to make it work. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is currently only one manufacturer and that's William Sound that, that uh, manufactures and makes available uh, a receiver uh, for, for that would replace uh, your smartphone. Uh, but again, uh, you're going to have to use either a neck loop or you're going to have to use Bluetooth uh, to uh, access the system. So that's the reason that a hearing loop is the, is the preferred technology to most people with hearing loss. Uh, it can serve one person, it can serve a hundred people, which, uh, uh, Bluetooth technology itself will not. It's discreet. You, you don't uh, have to make any kind of a show. You're not wearing a, a headset. You can use the remote to your hearing aids to turn the, the telecoils off and on. So people don't even know necessarily that a person is using the system and, and is hard of hearing. All you have to do is touch a button to turn it on. You don't have to borrow any equipment. Uh, there are no hygienical concerns, whether uh, the earbuds or the earphones have been uh, sanitized. Uh, there's no last minute rush. Uh, I know I have gone to meetings 
of where I thought I was going to be able to hear. And after you get in there and discover that you can't hear, it's, it's too late uh, to go out and, and ask if you can borrow uh, an FM a receiver or whatever they're using. Uh, and if you do, it may have dead batteries in it when you get back in the room. Uh, if you've got a, a hearing loop and uh, telecoil-equipped hearing aids or cochlear implant, all you have to do is turn, turn your hearing or your telecoils on. Uh, I know at one of our HLAA meetings here in Albuquerque, uh, one of the men came up to me and said, uh, did you know that so-and-so church has a hearing loop? Uh, because I maintain a list of known uh, loop facilities in town. And I said, no. And he said, well, you know, I went to a service there with, with a friend and uh, I couldn't hear. So just on a, on a chance, I decided to try my telecoils and see if it worked. They turned them on and there was a, a loop and it could hear just fine. Uh, we had a, a survey that the Committee for Communication Access did a couple of years ago uh, about hearing loops uh, in relation to uh, FM systems and infrared and so forth. And from the responses we got, uh, people indicated that they were three times more likely to use a hearing loop and the shell coils than they were to use a system where they had to borrow a receiver. A lot of people are told when they ask about uh, hearing loops or telecoils, oh, that's old technology. You don't, you don't need that. You don't need, you're going to have Bluetooth. Well, so it is old technology. That's true. The wristwatches are old technology, uh, and they're certainly uh, very important today. Uh, electric cars are old technology, uh, and they're the coming thing in cars today. The telephone is the same thing. It's old technology. Uh, and the technology really is old. Uh, actually, the, the story of, of induction loops begins way back in 1838 when a British scientist, Michael Faraday, discovered electromagnetic induction. Uh, as time passed, it came to be used for electrical components such as transformers, generators, etc. It was in 1885 that Italian Galileo Ferraris invented the first electromagnetic induction motor but nothing came of it. I guess they couldn't figure out a way to use it. So it was in 1888 that Serbian American Nikola Tesla uh, is credited as reinventing the motor. And uh, there again, that's old technology that's still in use today. Uh, I wasn't aware of where the name for the, for the uh, uh, Tesla cars came from until I did some research on this and discovered uh, that this was its origin. It was in 1937 that, that magnetic, electromagnetic induction loop systems were uh, invented by a Russian-born British telephone and sound engineer, uh, Joseph Polyakov. He was the founder of Multitone Electric Company in Great Britain, a company that is still in business today. And the first wearable hearing aids uh, that worked with a hearing loop were also invented by him. Uh, it was worn in his chest pocket and uh, it was uh, developed in 1938. Uh, that's the reason it's, it's not surprising that hearing loops are the primary assistive listening technology in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, Ampatronic, which is one of the major hearing loop manufacturers, says that over the last 30 years, induction loop hearing loops uh, have become the default assistive listening technology in Europe Scandinavia, Australasia, and they're now becoming increasingly prevalent in America. Now we talked about telecoils being in uh, these devices and many people don't know what a telecoil looks like. Or, uh, so here's a picture of telecoils. They're just a tiny copper receiver uh, that's found uh, in, tele in hearing aids and cochlear implant uh, processors uh, and they uh, receive the sound transmitted by uh, a loop as an electromagnetic signal. This is a picture of a typical behind the ear hearing aid with a telecoil in it. At one time, just a few years ago, uh, telecoils were found in 70% of all of the hearing aid models uh, and, and all of the cochlear processors uh, in the, uh, sold in this country. Uh, those figures have changed uh, since then because Cochlear Americas has taken the telecoil out of their processor. 
uh, and uh, the claim that research finds that, that people don't want to use them. Uh, where they did their research, of course, is a, a big question to anybody who is familiar with, uh, with processors like that. And the 70% the figure hasn't changed much, but the, num the total number of hearing aid models available has decreased. So there are fewer models available today with telequels than there were just three years ago. Uh, the last figures that I've seen uh, for, for Great Britain, 95% of all the hearing aids uh, issued by the National Health Service there contain telecoils. Now, what is a, actually a hearing loop? And this is a, uh, a, a demonstration and a question, I guess, for, for your visitor from New Jersey, uh, because this demonstrates how a hearing loop works. Uh, the, the speaker at a meeting uh, is talking into a microphone that sends his voice uh, to the uh, amplifier for the loop. The, the amplifier is connected to a wire that surrounds the room and creates an electromagnetic field. Uh, the sound from that electromagnetic field is transferred to the telecoils in a hearing aid or a processor, uh, which sends it on to the uh, circuitry in a hearing aid and is turned back into sound. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, it, th this technology can serve one person or a hundred people it's discrete. All you have to do is touch a button to turn it on. Uh, all of these are not news to, I'm sure, uh, any of you. Why a Bluetooth? Why a, a, a F or a, a hearing loop in place of Bluetooth? Well, Bluetooth, uh, regardless of what audiologists tell people when they say, "Oh, you don't need technology or, or telecoils," you're going to have Bluetooth. Uh, well, Bluetooth won't serve 100 people in a meeting room. Uh, if you had 100 people uh, wanting to listen to a speaker using Bluetooth, the speaker would have to have 100 different transmitters up there uh, to reach each of those people. Where, of course, with a, with a hearing loop, uh, the entire audience could, could uh, connect to it. Why not FM or, or infrared? As I said before, uh, you must borrow an, a receiver and return it. Uh, you would need to remove your hearing aids and, and or use earphones or earbuds, uh, and sounds not customized. Now, a lot of people don't realize that there are uh, a, a, is a big variety of types of loops. Uh, there's not just a, a typical uh, area loop like the, the uh, chart I showed before. Uh, there are also what's called perimeter loops, fa phased array loops, portable loops neck loops and, and many others. Uh, let's just look at some of those. This is a, a diagram of a, a phased array hearing loop. And it operates just the same as, as the uh, perimeter loop. Uh, it creates a signal that goes to, to people's hearing aids and turns the speaker's voice into the dominant sound in the room. But it has advantages over the, the uh, perimeter loop. A perimeter loop uh, has a lot of spillover and, and could be weak in the center. The first church that was looped here in Albuquerque had a perimeter loop. And the parishioner or the congregants learned that you really had to sit uh, on one side or the other of the church in order to hear the loop well. If you sat in the middle, you couldn't hear it uh, because the signal just wasn't strong enough. Uh, also, uh, the, the sound bleeds out from that. Uh, I have a loop in my living room, and it's, it's just a, a perimeter loop like this. If I go in the garage, I can still hear the TV, uh, which is uh, quite a distance away from me because that loop runs again along the uh, garage wall. With a phased array loop, that doesn't happen. It contains the sound. Uh, there's very little bleed on the outside of the, of the phased array. And the signal is equally strong uh, any place inside that loop. My first experience with something like this was at an HLAA convention. Uh, I arrived late to a presentation and there was a phased array that had been installed, uh, but it only circled the, the uh, area that had the chairs in it. 
And uh, a lady came in after the meeting had started and couldn't find a seat. So she decided she would just sit against the wall. And then she said, I, I can't hear the loop. I was told there was a hearing loop in here. And I told her, yes, but you're sitting out way outside the loop. Uh, if you come over and sit here, uh, even right next to this chair, uh, you'll be close enough that you'll hear it. And she moved over and said, oh, yes, that's great. I can hear fine now. Uh, that's one of the benefits of, of this type of a loop. At the convention, they can loop uh, adjacent uh, meeting rooms, and the sound from one uh, loop is not picked up by people in the next room. Uh, this uh, is, a, is, is a technology that has been improved over the last uh, few years, and a lot of people, especially audiovisual people, uh, are not aware of this. And when people ask them uh, about a hearing loop, they will use the argument, oh, you, you can't use this uh, because you're, you want to put a system in two different rooms and they're side by side. Uh, well, that's been proven to be wrong. There are now multiple places uh, around the country that have looped each one of their theaters uh, and there's no bleed between those theaters. All of these loops, if they're going to work well, need to meet the International Electrical Commission's uh, standards. Uh, which specifies the, the requirements for the field strength uh, of the loops uh, for hearing aid purposes. And people don't realize that, that there also are uh, International Electrical uh, Commission standards for hearing aids. And sometimes people don't have their hearing aids adjusted properly and they have difficulty hearing in a looped room simply because the, the, the signal uh, is not strong enough to, to uh, accommodate their poorly adjusted hearing aids. Uh, we had one woman who quit for a while coming uh, to the Hearing Loss Association meetings in Albuquerque uh, because she said, it's, it's too loud. Uh, I can't, I can't uh, turn my hearing aids down and it's loud enough that it hurts my ears. Uh, and I told her to go back to your audiologist and have your hearing aids adjusted. Uh, so that uh, the signal is not going to be that strong. And once she did, she was able to come to the meetings again. When someone is going to look into having a facility uh, looped, there are a lot of questions that they should ask. Uh, where and how was this installer trained? There are a lot of people out there doing installations who frankly don't know what they're doing. And the, the installations don't meet the international standards. Uh, they should be asked what loops uh, they have actually installed. Uh, they should ask who designed them. Uh, they should ask whether they are willing to provide a certificate of conformity to the IEC meeting or standards. Uh, all of these uh, questions that should be asked are listed in a best practices sheet uh, that's posted at the looping section of the uh, Hearing Loss Association's uh, website. But as I said, there are a lot of different types of loops that people are not necessarily familiar with. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the gates at the uh, Eugene, Oregon airport, and they have counter loops. You can see the picture on the left, uh, what that counter loop looks like, uh, so that people can talk to the attendant at the gate uh, at the airport. This is the portable loop. Uh, and there's two, two different ones shown here. Uh, some of them uh, have a uh, built-in microphone. Some of them, you, you plug the microphone in. At one of the hearing care offices here in Albuquerque, uh, they use uh, an F personal FM system. And there's a microphone and a transmitter uh, connected to the loop uh, that's standing on the, on the counter so that when the attendant uh, walks away uh, to get a file or anything else, uh, by, by wearing the personal FM uh, receiver and transmitter, uh, that person can hear what's being said uh, by the person at the counter and they can communicate with them even though they're not uh, right there at the counter. Uh, this is a, a new product from Cost, uh, Contacta where there's a built-in counter loop uh, in this uh, uh, particular a device that was designed because of the COVID-19 to protect people uh, from uh, contamination. This is another contact to product. 
that is being used by a, a chain of uh, hearing care officers here in New Mexico and Texas. Uh, as actually, it's a chain of 90 offices that has committed to, to promoting loop technology in all of their offices. Uh, these mats are placed in front of the counter rather than a counter loop. So a hearing aid where talking to people at the counter uh, can turn on their telecoils and get the sound from this uh, loop on the floor. Then of course there are loops for, for people's hearing aid, uh, living rooms uh, for their TV. Uh, some people uh, in, even loop the entire home. That loop can be uh, installed under the mop board in the living room, it can be in the basement, it can be, or the crawl space, it can be in the attic. Then there are chair loops uh, that can be put under the cushion uh, in the chair of somebody who's, who's watching uh, TV. Uh, or uh, if they're using a, a microphone, uh, it, can, it can be used to hear uh, at a family gathering uh, in the living room. Uh, actually, I have one like this under the mattress in, in the bedroom so I can hear the TV uh, without having to turn it up uh, loud. This is a, a card table that has built in microphones and it's looped so that people playing bridge uh, can hear a, 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 a bid or whatever the conversation is, is going on at the table. This is a clipboard that you think of as a personal amplifier uh, and it, it transmits, it has a, a stronger uh, receiver than your hearing aids uh, so that it will pick up voices that your hearing aids may have trouble getting and it transmits it to you electromagnetically. And then there are cars of people who have put in, installed uh, loops in the car so they can carry on conversations with other people in the car. And then there's the neck loop. Uh, I happen to be a, a big proponent of neck loops uh, and tell people to consider uh, a neck loop as the same thing as, as a, a headset or, or earbuds or earphones. Uh, there are two types of neck loops. Some are amplified and have a microphone in them and some are not amplified. Right now I'm wearing an amplified neck loop that's plugged into the computer uh, to carry on conversation in this uh, in, in this Zoom meeting, uh, but I also can plug it into my cell phone or into my landline uh, and talk to people hands-free uh, on the telephone. Neck loops can be used uh, for stereo or sound, surround sound systems. They can plug, uh, connect to a computer or a tablet, uh, as I said, the cell phone or a landline phone, an MP3 player uh, on a TV uh, equipped treadmill uh, when I go to the gym, I catch up on the news because while I'm on the treadmill, I plug my neck loop into the built-in TV uh, and get caught up on the news. Uh, you can also do this at home uh, or when you're traveling, if you have an extension cord for your neck loop. The piano that is shown there uh, is actually not uh, a regular piano. It's an electric piano. I have one like that and I can plug my neck loop into my piano and sit there and play and not disturb anybody else in the house. They don't hear a sound other than if I get very rambunctious and start hitting the keys very hard. And they hear clicking, but they don't hear any others, other music, which is fortunate uh, because there's a lot of bad notes in there. Now, actually, the history of hearing loops in this country, uh, really in my, from what I've been able to find out, starts with Rocky Stone, uh, who was the founder of HLAA uh, at the time called SHHH. Uh, I met Rocky actually at the Omaha convention and I discovered that you couldn't uh, speak to him and have him understand what you were saying unless you raised your voice a little bit. So I've always, I've always joked that actually he had to retire from the CIA because people couldn't whisper secrets into his ear. And he couldn't, he couldn't hear the secrets, so he had to quit. But he introduced hearing loops uh, to the SHHH chapters in the early 1980s. The Albuquerque chapter invested in one of those hearing loops uh, and used it uh, beginning in the early 90s uh, for over a decade. 
uh, before they got a location where they could install a permanent loop. The Christ United Methodist Church in Albuquerque was the first church that was looped here. And for many, many years, it was the only one. That's the one that I mentioned uh, where they had this, the perimeter loop and you had to sit on the sides of the church in order to hear well. If you sat in the middle, you couldn't hear. But it's really Professor David Myers uh, from Hope College in Holland, Michigan, that many of us see as the father of the looping movement in this country. Uh, Dave is the author of 17 books uh, on psychology. Uh, many of them are used as textbooks, uh, not just in this country, but worldwide. They've been, tra they've been translated into other languages. And he receives an enormous income from the royalties on these books. And it's actually Dave who has funded much of the Get in the Hearing Loop campaign that has been going on in this country for the last 10 years. Dave uh, just really experienced using a loop for the first time at a place called the Iona Abbey, uh, very remote in Scotland. He and his wife went to a service there and when they got inside, they had seen a sign that there was a hearing loop in there. When they got inside because of all of the echoes and everything else in this ancient cathedral uh, chapel, he couldn't understand what was being said at all. And his wife said, well, try that loop thing and see if it works. Well, Dave was dumbfounded. He just couldn't believe how well he was hearing once he connected that loop. So when he got back home to Michigan, he started promoting uh, hearing loops in Holland, uh, first uh, at his college and then in the community. And there are now over 900 hearing loops uh, on the west coast uh, of Michigan. Another of the early pioneers in the looping movement is an audiologist, uh, Dr. Bill Diles in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, Bill uh, started bundling uh, a small room hearing loop with every pair of hearing aids he sold and uh, has at this point uh, helped people uh, loop their homes, over 3,000 homes. Uh, and also uh, he has been instrumental in getting movie theaters and churches and other facilities uh, in Santa Rosa looped. And uh, in 2006, he presented uh, uh, a, a, pro a program on hearing loops here in Albuquerque uh, this was shortly after we organized our, our Loop New Mexico uh, initiative. And he flew at his own expense from California to Albuquerque uh, to present uh, to audiologists here who, who attended our meeting uh, on, on the technology. He reported the results of a survey that he did uh, in the hearing journal back then. And it demonstrated how much more satisfied people were with their hearing aids when they were using a hearing loop. Uh, you can see here that, that uh, uh, the, the people who had uh, a hearing loop on their TV were much, much more satisfied with their hearing aids than people who did not have uh, uh, a loop TV. They also, in another study, uh, were much more satisfied with the service they had gotten from, from his office uh, than they were uh, previously. It was back in 2005 here in Albuquerque, uh, we started uh, the Loop New Mexico initiative. It was actually uh, an, a researcher from Los Alamos Labs, uh, Jim Ogle, who, who was the father of our of our program here. Uh, Jim started coming to our meetings and when he discovered what a loop was and how it worked with his hearing aids, he said, you know, we've got to get this installed in other places around town. So that was the beginning of uh, the Loop New Mexico initiative, which to the best of my knowledge was the first uh, HLAA chapter uh, supported uh, hearing loop initiative. At about that same time, an organization called the Adult 
uh, loss of hearing association or Aloha in Tucson, Arizona, uh, also started an initiative called Let's, Tucson, Let's Loop Tucson, and then it uh, morphed into Let's Loop Arizona. A few years later in 2008, uh, Julia Sturkins, an audiologist in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, went to a, an expo, a hearing loss expo, that was organized by the State Association in Wisconsin. And uh, it was her first exposure to the promotion of hearing loops uh, by HLAA. Uh, Julia was trained as a speech pathologist in Holland. But when she came to this country, uh, she switched and uh, went back to school uh, to be trained as an audiologist. Uh, she was familiar with this technology because it was so common in Holland, but she really hadn't promoted it in her practice until she uh, attended that meeting and heard the presentation by Dave Myers. And then she, she started her Loop to Wisconsin uh, project. I met Juliet at the 2010 HLAA convention, and I hadn't uh, heard anything about her before. Uh, and she told me she had started uh, this movement in Wisconsin. And I told her about Loop New Mexico, and we were very proud of ourselves. We had over a hundred loops installed in, in New Mexico at the time. Well, lo and behold, in Michigan, they had over in Wisconsin, uh, in Wisconsin, they had over 250 loops installed. And uh, she had even roped her husband into, into working on this for, he's a retired engineer and he was doing the installations until they could find some other people who were qualified to install loops. 2010 was a watershed year for, for hearing loop technology, uh, partly because of changes to the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act uh, the ADA, and partly because of the Get in the Hearing Loop campaign of the Hearing Loss Association of America. It was in 2010 that, that an audiology professor from the University of uh, Florida, uh, Pat Krikos, uh, became the president of the uh, American Associate, the American uh, Audiology Association. And Pat was a promoter of hearing loops. And she and the executive director of HLAA decided that, that they would, would start uh, a, a national uh, initiative to raise awareness and availability of hearing loops. Now those ADA revisions were important uh, because that was the first time that assistive listening systems were actually required in places of uh, assembly, public places of assembly. Uh, before that, uh, they might have one, but it was not necessary. But now any place that had a public address system also had to have an assistive listening system. This didn't apply to churches or other places of worship, but otherwise, whether it was meeting halls or theaters or any place else, if they put in a new or an upgraded assistive listening system or, or PA system, they also had to have an ALS and that system had to be hearing aid compatible, meaning that uh, it would work with, with hearing aids. And the only technology available at that time and pretty much still today is telecoils. It also required that places with FM or infrared systems, 25% uh, of their receivers had to have neck loops rather than earphones or earbuds. That also was, was uh, when the Get in the Hearing Loop campaign uh, was kicked off by the uh, HLAA and AAA. In 2011, the very next year, uh, HLAA hosted the second international looping conference in Washington, DC. Uh, and that was a, a, an amazing, amazing convention. Uh, the number of people who stayed over uh, after the convention to take part in the uh, get in the hearing loop uh, uh, presentations and, uh, of this national or international looping organization was impressive. And it had uh, a dramatic effect 
on, on the people who attended. All of a sudden there were looping campaigns starting all over the country. Uh, some of them were, were uh, chapter, HLAA chapter inspired, others were independent. There were over three dozen HLA chapters uh, in, in a number of states uh, that were organized uh, and actively promoting the, the technology. There were, there were others that started that, that were not affiliated with, with HLA. In Loop, Minnesota, it was actually uh, Hearing Loss Association members who set up an independent uh, Loop, Minnesota program. The Sertoma Club started an, in a national uh, campaign uh, promoting hearing loops and individual Sertoma uh, clubs around the country have have donated thousands of dollars uh, to chapters and to other uh, entities that are promoting hearing loops. There have also been individuals around the country who have been very effective. Uh, Professor Carol Lomachy in Kearney, Nebraska uh, is a retired a professor from the University of, of Nebraska at Kearney. And she single-handedly uh, went out and promoted the, the looping of the uh, fine arts building at the university. But she didn't stop there. Then she started promoting the looping of other theaters and places of worship in Kearney, a town of 40,000 people. And they now have over a dozen public venues that have hearing loops. Uh, Dr. Richard Meininger has done the same thing uh, south of uh, Dr. Lamaki in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, he was a retired professor from uh, the university there, and he did the same thing. He got the fine arts building looped and then started promoting it uh, around the community. Uh, hearing care offices are now getting in the loop. Uh, a few years ago, I did a, a Google search for hearing offices that were promoting uh, loops and telecoils. And I found very few. Now, when you go online, if you, if you search uh, hearing care telecoils, you'll come up with an unbelievable number of hearing care offices that have added to their website information on loops and telecoils and are promoting it uh, by looping uh, their waiting room and looping their fitting rooms. Also, uh, and this goes again to your, to your visitor from New Jersey, there are now nine states uh, that have legislation mandating uh, that hearing aid buyers must be counseled on, on uh, telecoil technology before they are fitted and sold with hearing aids. Uh, there are also ongoing efforts to do this in California, Colorado, Iowa, and Wisconsin. New York City now mandates that any public uh, city building uh, that is either new or uh, where the place of assembly is either new or upgraded, they must install loops. Uh, Minnesota has done the same thing as far as state buildings are concerned. If there is a new uh, Minnesota a state building uh, constructed or one is updated, they now must include a hearing loop uh, in that building. There are efforts in Maryland and Indiana also to get legislation like this passed. Now, where do you find hearing loops? Uh, probably the most common place around the country, and there's thousands of them at this point, are places of worship. Either they've looped the, the uh, sanctuary or they have added neck loops to their FM or infrared systems. Movie theaters also now, uh, practically all of them should be offering this technology. If they haven't looped the theater itself, then they probably have neck loops for their infrared or FM receivers. Back uh, at the time that the ADA was upgraded, uh, a lot of these theaters were using old sound systems. They then transitioned into new uh, sound systems. And when they do that, did this, they had to add the neck loops. So people need to know that when they go to the theater, uh, they can ask for a neck loop rather than a headset. Other performance spaces uh, have put in loops. The grand old Grand Opera House in, in Oshkosh, Wisconsin is looped. 
the Albuquerque Little Theater was the first of six local theaters uh, that have installed hearing loops in their auditoriums. The Purple Cow, that's called uh, the Van Weasel Auditorium in uh, Florida, is looped. It's called the Purple Cow because not only is the building purple, but the seats are purple, the curtains are purple, the carpets are purple. Uh, I experienced uh, that when it was brand new when I went down there uh, as a representative of Columbia artist to to uh, book some performances. Uh, there's a, an HLAA member, actually, he's the, the past president, I believe, of your state association uh, there in New York, uh, Jerry Bergman, who has put together a list of over 300 known performance spaces uh, throughout the United States. And he continually is adding to that list. Uh, auditoriums, uh, in small towns, auditoriums, in big cities, uh, every place. Uh, hearing loops are also found in waiting rooms. Here, here's an example of, a, of an office and also uh, of the waiting room in an audiology office. Here are some examples of unusual uh, hearing loops that, that are, are cropping up. Uh, it can be at a checkout counter in a, in a grocery store, a drive through bank window, uh, also a prescription counter in, in a Walgreens drugstore. Wegmans food markets have begun installing induction loops uh, in the pharmacy counters uh, at all 88 of their stores in the Northeast. Uh, Kinney Drug uh, has done the same thing. They're, they're looping the, the prescription counter uh, at, at their uh, drug stores. Transportation hubs are becoming uh, a primary source of, of uh, hearing access through hearing loops. The Charles Ford Airport in Grand Rapids, Michigan was looped over 10 years ago and was the first airport in this country uh, to have hearing loops, uh, not just at their departure gates, but also in the concourse. Uh, there are hearing loops uh, as some of the ticket counters in Union Station in Washington. In Milwaukee, they have a place they call the Intermodal uh, uh, Station, and it uh, services long distance and commuter trains, uh, long distance and commuter buses, and even taxi cabs. And they've installed uh, hearing loops in that facility. Airports, uh, as I said, are becoming uh, a center for this. Again, the Gerald Ford Airport, uh, the Delta Airlines, the, the picture there of a Delta Airlines gate in Detroit, Michigan, and an information counter at the airport in Atlanta. This is your own airport where they had uh, looped the gates and this is how they laid out the, uh, the phased array loop at that gate before they put the wires down. This is one of those portable loops uh, at the airport in Seattle, Washington. This is another of the counter, counter loops uh, at the airport in Eugene, Michigan, or I mean, uh, Eugene, Oregon. This is a list of the 20 airports that now feature uh, hearing loop technology in one way or another. Uh, in the case of Los Angeles, uh, they're installing hearing loops at a new facility they're building uh, for the car rental counters. Virgin Atlantic is now offering neck loops in place of earphones, uh, or as an option uh, uh, instead of earphones on their international flights. But you don't really need to fly Virgin Atlantic to use the neck loop on an airliner. Uh, the, the, Earbuds that they give out on the airlines have terrible, terrible sound quality. And if you have a neck loop on most airlines, you can plug it in and hear the movie that you're watching or hear music much better than you would uh, using their earbuds. And you don't have to take your hearing aids off and try and figure out a place to put them so they're not going to get lost uh, when you're in that crowded airport, uh, air, airplane. Uh, I did this on a flight from from uh, New York to Madrid and on to, and then again to uh, Paris, uh, where I listened to Placido Domingo all the way from New York 
uh, to Madrid uh, using my neck loop instead of the earbuds that they gave out. Uh, another place that, that uh, you're going to be finding uh, loops is uh, in subways and other, tra other rail travel. Uh, pictured here is the first of, of what they hope to be 45 looped uh, stations in, in the Bay Area rapid transit system. They already have looped over a thousand of the train cars uh, in uh, the BART system. You'll find loops in other uh, surprising places. There's a photograph of a loop a sign in a, in a tour boat. The other one is a picture of the city council chamber here in Albuquerque that is looped. Uh, I've always found this interesting, this Culver's drive through uh, fast food place that has a hearing loop. Uh, the ticket booth at Disney World is looped. Uh, and, and it's not just that one booth, all of them are looped. Again, un unexpected places. This is the Breslin Center, a 12,000 seat uh, facility at Michigan State University. All 12,000 of those seats are served by hearing loops. This is a uh, funeral parlor in New York City, and they, they have individual uh, parlors there for uh, multiple services. They're all looped. New York City is becoming the poster child uh, for uh, hearing loops. As I said earlier, uh, they now require that any renovated uh, or new city financed assembly area uh, must have loops. Uh, the Nederlander organization, one of the major owners of, of live theaters uh, in New York City has looped a, a half dozen of their theaters and their plan is to install hearing loops in all of them. The Schubert organization is following suit. Uh, other theaters have added neck loops to their uh, FM or infrared systems. All new New York City taxi cabs have to have hearing loops. Uh, this one they happen to call, uh, oh goodness, I've got it covered up and I can't, I can't tell you the name. Uh, but it's a, it's a Nissan cab, uh, and it's not just these cabs, it's any new taxi cabs must have a hearing loop. There are hearing loops uh, at some of the ticket counters in Grand Central Station. The Mitzi Newhouse and Vivian Beaumont theaters, which are theaters that present uh, Broadway show type uh, productions at Lincoln Center are looped, and the Avery Fisher Hall, which has been renamed Giffen Hall, is in the process of being completely renovated and they've promised to loop that facility. There are hearing loops installed at the box office uh, at Madison Square Garden. There are hearing loops at the ticket and information counters in Penn Station. The buses that uh, uh, transport people uh, to view the Bronx Botanical Gardens are looped. There are hearing loops at the uh, information counter at the Metropolitan Museum and the Guggenheim Museum has loops. All 600 New York City subway fare and information counters have hearing loops now. And I lived in New York for over a decade, uh, actually working right across the street from Carnegie Hall and used this particular subway stop uh, as my uh, means of getting home after work or in the morning. Uh, and I knew how noisy it is, uh, even when a train comes through uh, a subway stop. So the last time I went to New York, uh, the first thing I did was, was go to this subway stop and see if the hearing loop really worked. I went up to the counter just as the train was going through an express train that didn't stop, was going through underneath. I turned on the telecoils uh, turned off the microphones in my hearing aids and carried on a very, very uh, effective conversation with the man on the other side of the glass. But New York City is going further. Uh, they have ordered a thousand new subway cars, all of which will have hearing loops. And they're testing loops on the uh, bus uh, buses in New York. Uh, Jerry Bergman was one of the 
uh, people who was involved in testing those uh, loops. The new Delta Airlines terminal at uh, LaGuardia Airport, all of the gates have been looped. But the, the really important thing in New York where transportation is concerned was the recent change uh, by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey uh, in the requirements uh, that they place on all of the trans transportation facilities that they manage. Uh, they now have decided that all new or significantly renovated airport terminals must have hearing loops at the departure gates and at information counters. And they took it a step further, uh, requiring that information counters be looped at all bus, train, and ferry terminals uh, when they do any renovations. Uh, this is going to impact, I think, transportation terminals, uh, especially airports, uh, all over the country. Also, Amtrak recently announced, actually it was in June, uh, that they have ordered 83 what they call train sets, which are engines and cars, uh, amounting to 500 cars, uh, all of which will have hearing loops. And they have uh, an option for 800 more. So this is something that, again, is going to, uh, I think, have a dramatic impact. There are other examples in transportation of hearing loops being used. The Indian Trails uh, bus line in uh, Northern Michigan and Wisconsin uh, has looped all of their buses. There's a symbol uh, at a bus uh, facility in Seattle that is looped. Steve, can I interrupt you? Certainly. Uh, we are at our uh, contracted out for the captioner, but we've agreed we can continue for another 15 minute block if we could wrap it up. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the rest of this very quickly. Uh, what I have now is, is just slides on uh, the showing the presence of hearing loops uh, in Europe, because it's not just in this country that, that uh, this is an important technology. Uh, anybody please who... Ahead. Please go I'm ahead. Sorry? Please go ahead, knowing I may have to switch over to the automated captions. Okay. Uh, so here, here are examples of, of loop technology in England. Uh, this is at uh, train stations and airports. Here are additional examples of uh, hearing loop signage uh, showing the availability of hearing loops. Uh, I found it interesting that even out in the parking lot, they have a help point. Uh, if you're having a problem out there uh, and you're hard of hearing, uh, you're going to be able to hear uh, somebody when you when you talk to them inside 